podcast. Final check. Final check before we get on going with the world famous Nikaias Duncan. I don't know about world famous, but uh, I don't know. If you hit 30,000 Twitter followers, then you are famous. That's just life. And uh, I double checked today and you are over. Okay, we're way better. All right. So I want to thank you guys uh, for sticking with me. Um, Of course, all of my streams have to have five minutes of me um, going to trade school, um, which I appreciate. Um, I want to thank everybody for coming out. Um, And this this is both a guest and a topic I'm really excited about because... Uh, we're going to talk about defense, and we're going to talk about uh, why help side defense is particularly important, um, which is a topic that is very hard to discuss publicly, um, partially because um, it requires uh, a lot of nuance, which is a thing that Twitter was invented to destroy. And the second reason is that it's really hard to um, explain some of the concepts at, at different levels without a visual medium. And that's one of the reasons that I uh, wanted to do this particular project was that it allowed for, you know, long form conversations about a particular player or genre of of player. But also it allows you guys to to watch with us and and see what we see and and do some of the uh, the backgrounding stuff. So I have uh, the help side hero himself, the LMBO legend, uh, the dunker spot Don, uh, Nikias draft, Nikias draft Duncan. That's right. We got Nikai's into the draft, and let's start. Everybody, say hi to our wonderful guest. Um, so um, I wanted to start this off a little bit differently. These are going to be the main topics that, like, we're sort of going to get to discuss today, um, which are our positionality, uh, winning mentality, shooting projection, safe havoc, and lineup theory. Um, the first one is pretty simple to me. It's just like, what exactly is Garuba? Um, it's a pretty difficult question. Um, I think that when people say Draymond, like when, when people's only comp for you as a Hall of Famer, that's usually a sign that uh, things are in a weird way. Um, the, the second one is winning mentality, uh, which is basically like when you play for a really good team, you can only act certain ways. Um, shooting projection, which of course you, you talked to me at length before we hopped on about your, your newfound shooting expertise. <laughs> um, uh, safe Havoc, which is, you know, gamble. Can you do it safely? And last one's Lineup Theory, which I'm really excited to talk about you with. Um, so here we go. We have Anadolu Efes versus uh, Real Madrid in about three weeks ago. Um, and let's do it. We have the uh, stats crawl at the bottom. So... We're going to start here in, uh, in a little bit of, uh, by the way, this is Shane Larkin, by the way. Um, we're going to start with some high pick and roll. Uh, Real is in drop with Garuba often, but not always. We got a drive and kick. Yes, that's E.D. Tavares. Um, Larkin is uh, obviously uh, EuroLeague Steph Curry and probably one of the more unstoppable forces in, in basketball currently. Um, we're going to come off, off a little uh, pin down, uh, run some Rondo pick and roll, and you can see right here, we have the, the jagged line is a, is a drive. We're going to have a drive. They're going to ice that pick and roll, and then it's going to be a pick and pop. We have help on the, on the strong side. What is it that you're looking for when you look at, at, at ice pick and rolls that are like sort of on the slot, but not really? Um, in terms of those particular pick and rolls, like obviously you don't want to give up middle if you're playing that coverage. Mm-hmm. So it really depends on that weak side tagger to get there early and tag that roller. Since they're basically outside of those, uh, you're outside of the defensive big. And of course, you're not really worried about the guard at that point. So make sure you tag that, make sure that role isn't there. Uh, when that tag is there, behind that, you're going to want someone to split the difference between the guys on the weak side there. And you just kind of rotate on the swing, from, on the string from there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, a, a theme that we're going to get is that, um, that Garuba is really good rotationally, and then he'll lose a little bit at point of attack. So here he's going from, from off ball where he's extremely good to on ball where he's closing out. You can see a really jagged closeout. That's the, the, the feet are really forward. That allows that top foot to get attacked. Once the top foot is flipped, or a hip flip or a foot flip, it allows for, for attack into the paint. Here we sort of see like what happens when there is a ill-aligned like slot penetration. This is the Nuggets. We have uh, MPJ close out really hard. Again, top foot doesn't fully seal off. 
and there's not a great rotation to be had. You can see the midline Jokic isn't there. Um, I think that's Murray can't fully dig without giving up a shot. And then like you have to have two rotations because of one bad closeout. So because of one bad closeout, you suddenly have four people covering one. And now it's, you know, one defender basically for the three on the right side and the one on the left. It's a difficult circumstance that closes for you. Um, how, how would you deal with like this particular circumstance uh, when you look at it like in terms of as a, as a analysis? Like you have a lot of help and you have a, a weak shoot. Oh, can you repeat the question? Yeah, like what are you seeing when you see somebody who doesn't shoot? Like, and there's a lot of help. Oh, so in terms of what I would want from that non-shooter or just the defense in general? Just, just, like, just talk me through it. I mean, whatever whatever thoughts you have on this particular, like... Oh, if there's a non-shooter, then obviously you want to show help elsewhere. Um, mm -hmm. Clog the paint. You don't want to worry about that. Um, in the case of the non-shooter, there needs to be some sort of movement. Like, I don't think just kind of standing in one spot really helps you. Mm -hmm. Because even if you're looking at someone splitting the difference, like, you know which way they're going to rotate if the ball is swung out. They're not worried about you. So yeah. either cut from the corner or the slot or wherever you are and kind of force some attention that way. Or if you have a shooter beside you, set a hammer yeah. or set a flare and get them open that way. So here we're going to see an action that, that you see a lot, which is sort of a, a pick and roll on the go. And then they're going to fuzz or, or blur the weak side tag. Um, so, you know, it's going to be Garuba is the tag. Larkin's going to switch. You don't want to help off Larkin ever because he basically has range to half court. And Garuba has this weird responsibility where his man is lifting, but he also has to have the tagger. So he's tagging one pass away. Um, and it's a really difficult responsibility. Like when you are tagging one pass away, it your brain is like, this is this is tough. So they are gonna have this little this down screen, then we're gonna get, you know, this quick intersection, sort of like a nick screen. And now we're downhill. So now Garuba has to get this tag, but he also has to get, you know, back to his man. He misses the tag and it gives up a lay. Again, we can see sort of the same concept as like everybody has to be on a string. When one thing happens, this is going to be the Blazers in a one three one. In a one three one, those you know the red areas are, are where you have diff like where you have to have an interchange where an, an intersection has to happen. So as you can see, the ball move, all five players move on a string. So ball swings, and you're going to get rotation, rotation, rotation to basically replace where the one prior was because you always want to maintain shape. And that's a thing that like that's the difficulty with describing defense on a podcast or in a small video is that it's really difficult to make, like teach ideas of shape and, and spatial relationships. As you can see, continues, we get into the rotation. Those are the difficulties. So when we're talking about Gruben, why he's special is that he can maintain these unique shapes. He can really fight through these moments that younger guys, I mean, especially teenagers, especially playing at high level basketball, like most often don't get. Um, and then on offense, you sort of have this, this hesitancy because he's, a four or a five for Real Madrid because they want to win. Like he's really valuable, but he's also like kind of scared to do essential things. Like here he catches and shoots a three and it's, it goes, but in the NBA and we've seen this with the Coro is like, if you catch and don't make a quick decision, like teams will start to hound you. Like teams can get really, really difficult here. We have overhelping. This should be a catch and shoot every time, whether you're like a 30% shooter or a 45% shooter. And because of that, he lets, like, you can see the panic, well, almost a turnover. The second time around, he's going to catch and shoot, and we're going to get into the shooting mechanics. But how painful in the NBA is it currently to have a specifically a four who doesn't shoot when he's wide open or can be covered by two people? Yeah, it, it's kind of death if you don't have that. Like, those record scratches kill your offense. I mean, it kills your offense, makes it so much easier on the defense. And once you're late in clock, it kind of doesn't matter who you're up against or how bad the defense mm -hmm. is. If you're late in the clock, it's going to be a contested look, and the defense is won at that point. So there has to be a level of decisiveness, even mm -hmm. if you are a non-shooter, like catch and drive, yeah. catch and fire. Or again, if you find yourself kind of open, it's like a split a different situation on your side of the floor, like cut or screen. Yeah. With his jumper, the thing we're going to see is that he has a, a problem uh, like making energy efficient. That's sort of like the squiggly line was that he doesn't do the energy efficiency really well. Here we got a, a better tag. He tries to flop on the tag. Usually he just tries to punch a guy, which I appreciate. <laughs> just like really, like if somebody's going to cut through your lane, you make them pay. So again, we get the same concept. It's, you know, the, the pick and roll on the grow. We have a fuzz on the weak side. He tags. Like this is, this is doing his responsibility. Usually he hits a guy harder. 
he's able to get up and, and close out, get a stop. Like that's that's what a fantastic possession looks like defensively against that particular alignment. Right, right. I mean, it's such a big difference from that earlier clip to where he isn't there early. I think that's really the big key. Like, mm -hmm. he knows where to be, but it's also the timing of it. Mm -hmm. Even in that first clip, he went to the right spot. He wasn't out of position. It's just he was late and then didn't really bring any physicality. And then on that recent clip, he gets there early, ends up getting bowled over, flop, whatever. Mm -hmm. But even that allows the big to kind of rotate over. Um, the pass is bobbled from there. And you get a kick out to a shooter. It's a wide, it's a wild shot because he's on the floor. But like you were able to rotate and you kind of live with the result there. Yeah, I, I think that like a thing that like when when I watch like really poised players like like Liz is that like on their catch, they even if they don't want a particular shot, defenses can't get them flustered. Like we mm -hmm. just saw him like a lot of times it's a record scratch because like you can literally hear the record they er, and they're so afraid. Um, mm -hmm. And that's and that's really difficult where if he can just get to the point where he makes a quick decision. It's like I'm going to shoot or I'm going to drive. That changes everything a lot. And I think that's what we've seen with the Caro. Uh, oh yeah, we're here already. Okay. Um, so there's a small problem that, um, here we're going to get like a, a sort of high Spain pick and roll, but instead of to the rim, it's a flare out, um, you know, a light screen up top and then a flare to the weak side. So here, uh, he's defending as a, as a wing rather than as a big, um, you'll see, you'll see his man flares. He's going to get lightly hit by this. Larkin's going to, has the skip. Here we got a close out. Um, Usman has some issues with closing out on balance, especially with deceleration. And he gets the first one. You know, great job. He rotates. Again, another tag. This should be a really easy closeout. He just mm -hmm. has to make sure that the, no middle. And, like, if you can push them baseline, you have help towards that baseline. He kicked again. Bad high foot. He's off balance, and he tries to reach. And now you have a one-on-one, -on -one, or a one-on-two going to the ring. Because that far side wing isn't going to particularly help off, off the shooters that, that FS has. And again, we see that like one mistake can alter shape in a really specific way. So this, they had the decision completely locked down, and now it's a one-on-two at the rim. It's up to Edie to to close things out. Um, yeah, here we're going to see show. What are your thoughts on this show? So he's going to come out. It's like a sort of a high show, and his hands are in a weird place. Um, you know, it's again. It, this is a very horizontal league. You won't see that many of like this particular type of action where you have like a, a bunched corner and you're running a pick and roll from the slot. That's not something mm -hmm. you see in the NBA a lot. Um, and Madrid obviously doesn't uh, show Tavares, but they'll show Usman, which I think is is cool to have a teenager you trust showing. That being said, like his show technique is like his retreat technique isn't always great. Like again, we're asking mm -hmm. for a guy who has to when you compare people to Draymond, it's like hey, be good at everything defensively. Which is a huge bar to clear at, at a you know uh, at a level like this. So here we see the show. Watch his hips; they flip. He suddenly isn't facing anything. He has to refine. the The possession gets scrambled, and it's not. It doesn't come up on his responsibility. But those the hips, like the things that make Draymond special, the things that make Paul Millsap special. Another like lower level Draymond comparison. Another guy who mm -hmm. you know learned how to shoot after being a rebounding monster. Like is the fact that they are such fantastic movers and. Comparisons to them should sort of be based on the movement skills first and then get to the like the, the ridiculous IQ. Right. Uh, this is your boy Roddy Boubois, by the way. <laughs> uh, like, I think it's encouraging that he again the IQ stands out, like he know he knows where he's supposed to be. Um, even with the technique being kind of off, he does keep the hands high so you don't get the pass over the top while mm -hmm. he's retreating. So I think it's kind of low hanging fruit to kind of fix the technique. Mm -hmm. The important part to me, especially with him being as young as he is, is that he knows, hey, I need to have my hands up. I know I need to flip my hips quickly. And he can do that physically. Yeah. And he also knows where his man is. So it's not like you're get, catching him out of position. Yeah. He also has super quick hands, which makes life a little bit easier. Um, I think that one of my concerns with him as a five is that like in the dunker spot, he's not necessarily a vertical threat. Like mm -hmm. he has really, he has good pop, but he doesn't have like, I touch the top of the backboard whenever I want pop. Right. Um, so, like, here we'll see, like, they reject a screen. There's a bit of a high show. He's in the dunker spot. And, like, realistically, this should be a lob. Because the help is over. The 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 tag man, like, should be all the way down to, to take out his legs, but he does not. So mm -hmm. put the ball, like, at the square and make Uzmanko get it at the dunker spot. Um, he can 
get close, but that that the fact that teams his teammates aren't throwing that ball, the fact that they're not putting the ball that high, does show that there is some like difficulty. And then the NBA is another step physically up with fives. Mm-hmm. So I think just mentioned it earlier, like they already aren't guarding him as a non-shooter. Mm-hmm. Um, since he doesn't have that uh, vertical pop, like I would prefer for him maybe less in the dunker spot and more setting those hammers, setting those flares and getting yeah. shooters open. I think that would be a more effective use for him since he doesn't really have the finishing like that. Yeah, and like he's a, I think that last year uh, I, I wrote a lot about people who can jump moving backwards and how like that, how essential that is for drop coverage. And he can do that. He can jump while moving backwards, but it's not like nuts. Like playing Milwaukee drop is so hard. It, mm-hmm. It's such a physical, like it is a physical it is you have to be a physical marvel to really do it to like be about seven feet tall and like be backpedaling and jump as high as possible at the same time. Um, here we see the hands again. He's able to fluster like really high level guards with his hand placement. He he reaches a lot and he reaches like with his whole body. It's not just like the little baby swipes. Um, and like, but he is capable of really flustering with those shows. Like he's doing a lot with them. But look at how much like look at how uncomfortable these guards are. That being said, we're going to, you know, he gets a great, again, that's a perfect possession right there. Like, he does a fantastic job. The ball comes out. He has a rotation. His legs do not go underneath him. He gives up, like, again, where are his feet pointing? It's saying giving up middle, which is like, again, I know Real Madrid does not ask people to go middle on on middle closeouts. So he has his feet the wrong way on this closeout. Um, And instead of, like, trying to force a spin, like, you sell all out, there's not going to be middle. And if he had sold out here, instead he doesn't, he reaches, it's a ticky tack foul. Um, we're going to have another pick and roll. Again, the, against Snakes, does a good job. Here's the same thing. He's he, he's in the probably the most difficult physical positioning. Like, offhand, I'd say there's probably like 15 people in the world that can jump at their full height moving backwards. Do you feel like that's fair, talking about the scarcity in the NBA? Yeah, that sounds about right. And, um, like, as good as his hands are, you'll see as he drops... Um, you'll you'll see as he drops, he's capable of just like he's lashing. It's not the same skill of catching the ball, which like people are going to see. Like he's just not. He's not as big as you want. If he were six ten, he'd be a, like a like close to a Mobley level. And like sometimes his hands just aren't quite in the right place. Like he's good at a lash, but he's not necessarily like his hands are not always high. Like I think about Aiden a lot, where like if he puts his hands in any one of these lines, like he's getting a deflection. <laughs> but instead, his hands are like in a weird spots where it's like, he's not mapping the possible passes. Like he's not saying like the one way that I keep getting beat is over the top. So I'm going to have my hands to prevent that over the top pass. Um, the switch ability is interesting. Again, here we have a missile line footwork. He's saying, give, give middle, um, even though the fact that he has two people help baseline. And so what's going to happen when you give somebody middle, um, uh, is that like, they're going to go middle. They're going to get a layup. He's lucky enough here on this switch, which, like, I think you can switch him in the NBA, but he has this particular thing that, like, I've never really seen, is that he loves to get blown by and then not slow down and go block a shot. A lot of times he does this on dump-offs, which is, like, one of the wildest things I've ever really seen. Um, but, like, in the NBA, that's really, like, if you if you are slow on rotation against Paul George, like, that is going on your head. If you're doing that mm-hmm. against Zion, that is on your head. Like, that's a, that's a tough area to, to help. Yeah, like he may be able to get away with that against some secondary creators. I don't think he's gonna be able to do that against the top guys. But like mm-hmm. to your point about him kind of letting guys blow by him and getting chased down, it's like it reminds me of LeBron. Like he's not a LeBron level athlete, obviously, but like the process is kind of similar mm-hmm. to where he's just trying to map the ball, give a false sense of security, and get back there. But it's also like a football thing, right? To yeah, they lay off a little bit on a route and make yeah. it make, think that window's open. And he just jumps it. And I think he could, I think that he could like do this at an NBA level eventually, but like the, the thing is that he's not doing it with regular ones. He's doing this on Shane Larkin. Like he's doing this on the highest degree of difficulty when he's on an Island. And like, mm-hmm. there's not a particularly good sense of help. Like it would be one thing if you were gambling, it'd be another thing if you were gambling with your feet in the right spot, which like he is here. And then he's not like he, he's in the right spot and then he stops to just like gamble it's it's a hard thing to reconcile because he's basically playing the game on super hard mode. That's when he gambles. Um, well, like on that front, do you think it's is that concerning or is that more encouraging for you that he's able to kind of he's making things harder on himself, but he's still winning most of the time? Um, I think it's encouraging. Uh, 
I mean, first of all, like one of the things I really look for young guys is mentality and the fact that like he's trying things in an environment where he like he probably shouldn't be is mm-hmm. good. Partially because like we're like I had initially a lot of worries about his confidence. Um, here we get the nice little up and under, um, which is a good patience in points for like if you make a first initial idea. Like again, we'll go back to Liz. Liz is going to get tripled, just a light ball fake to start things out, and that gets her the space to operate. Like having an idea of what you're going to do and not being like worried by a situation. Like if you panic here, it's going to be a turnover. But if you don't panic, you you have time to operate because now you've engaged other defenders. Um, I think that like him trying these cool things on defense is a good sign for his confidence because like guys who don't shoot open jumpers worry me. Um. Do you think so? If he's not going to have the size, like I think that's what stands out with Draymond, because even though he doesn't have the size, he does have the length, but also he's just strong as heck. Yeah, and I don't think Ozman is that. Like he's a strong dude, but he just isn't that. So I kind of worry about what that looks like against Fives. Like even if it's not him getting posted up and hooked over, yeah, the shot goes up and it's you know he's battling on, <laughs> on the offensive glass. Like what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, I think that the idea of him being a five is like a thing that to me is a non-starter. Like, mm-hmm. I think that there is a... I would like him to play five a small percentage of minutes. Um, because, like, there are... It is interesting to have a guy who can do this, which, like, is... He rips a 5'8 dude who's lightning fast, then recovers to block a shot about 14 feet away. Mm-hmm. Um, again, this is a show on a pick and roll. This is, like, what happens when he is perfectly aligned. You know, he reaches a little bit. That's why he doesn't strip it perfectly clean. And then, like, this is where he jumps from. That's about a step outside the free throw line. And that's an NBA three. And he's going to get, like, a full half. Like, he's going to get a half finger on this. Because it doesn't even come close to them. It's ridiculous reactivity. Yeah. It's it's amazing, like, how quickly he maps out what's happening and how quickly he reacts to it. Especially because he's not, like, a great mover. Like he mm-hmm. he's he's sort of like a like a he's like a downhill skier where like he has some maneuverability but like you can't do big turns. Um, with his jumper, the thing that that stands out to me is that his like his elbow points inward. Like if you want to try to put your elbow towards your left shoulder, you'll get an idea of, of how he uh, like he shoots, and that causes the hand to drift. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that's what causes like he has some wild misses, and I think it's just that like the elbow is pointed weird, and that causes the hands to be pointed weird. Um. Oh, looks like I didn't perfectly clean this one. Okay, so um, it, it reminds me, like, to point this out, like, a guy who doesn't have perfect elbow but has, like, a good amount is Kawhi. It's so, like Kawhi's elbow goes in a little bit, but he still gets his hand under the ball. And finding a midpoint where you can straighten the elbow out as much as possible, not everybody wants to be perfectly pointed at the rim, but to get so that there is a consistent, like, you know, lancing towards the rim. The elbow points towards the rim. The wrist points towards the rim. Everything points towards the rim. Where, like, yeah, there's a little bit of dip, but it's better than where Garuba is now, where everything is all the way over. Um, and that's, to me, what causes, like, these really drastic misses. Um, I find his jumper to be, like, very good, speaking honestly. Like, it it looks to me like a good jumper in under construction. Like, mm. I mean, watching a lot of prospects, you have to see some strange jumpers. And, like, there's nothing about it that really worries me. Um, so here we see, like, what happens when you lose the scouting report. He's pushing the defender right at the top of the key, which, like, that's fair. Most, like, you have you have help right. Uh, then now he's, he's pushing him left. And not just left, but, like, if if James Harden were a righty, that, that would be mm-hmm. the degree you would push him left. Um and it just doesn't make sense. Like, you shouldn't sell out that. You should not sell out that hard. And then he, he sells out even harder on on the rip. So, like, he's getting these reasonable results, but, like, the process is very strange. Um, again, good tracking. Good tracking this pick and roll. Like, but he, he rejects it and snakes it. Like, that should be a problem. Here we, we switch the feet. This is happy feet. He flips it. We're here. Then he reaches at the very back point. He's about to cross. If if that big gets that cross off, he's getting cooked. <laughs> um, and he's able to dribble twice, which is the first thing we've seen from him in this game. Um, I think we're in the third quarter now. He doesn't play at all in the second quarter. Um, here we see uh, here we see like how comfortable we are in help, which I think is is the long term like a long term concern. If he's a four, 
out of five, is like how far can he help? Like we've seen him cover a lot of space, but he struggles to change direction, which is mm-hmm. a hard thing to stunt and recover because stunting and recovering is covering space. So when you see him, like how much help do you want to give? By the way, great underhanded grandma shot around the rim. Had to include that. <laughs> so we see he's kind of close. Like I think it would be easier for him to overhelp initially and then recover in a straight line, but because he has to help one way, like sort of like running a suicide, like you run there and back, that's a huge issue for him. Um, and that limits his mobility as a four because, like, what are teams going to do? Put him in uphill actions where he has to recover a huge weight after tagging. Yeah, I could imagine with that kind of issue, you just kind of clear a side and force him to help. Yeah. Put him in some real pick your poison situations. And, you know, if he doesn't clean up the technique, which we've talked about throughout the stream, then that's an easy attack on the closeout. And with the rest of the defense scrambling, I mean, that's death in today's NBA. Yeah, they can just put him in Spain every single possession and say, tag the big, see what happens. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, this one. You have to shoot this. I'm sorry, like every single time you have to shoot this. There's not, like, he doesn't even look at the rim, which is to me a larger indictment. Like, Madrid is a specific circumstance where, like, he is a cog on a, like, a really, really good team. And so, like, mm-hmm. they don't want him to do guard stuff. It's like, no, we, we pay people to do that, so, so do big man things. And that creates a, a difficulty when evaluating where it's like, well, I think he's a wing, but he's not really allowed to do wing stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Just because, like, it's not, there's a million guards in, in Europe. Like, you can find so many people who can do the things that you're asking. Another bad time for your boy Roddy Bootball. He gets absolutely nailed here. Uh, it's, it's a classic moving screen. Like, in Europe, the idea of a, a moving screen is, is pretty loose, but this is, uh, this is still going to get called. Uh, Roddy, Roddy gets a little bit hurt, uh, has a moment with, with the, with the ground. Mm. And here we get that, that reactivity. They put him in an action. He's able to get his hands to the ball. Uh, and then we have our first dribble adventure. Um, this is really the only time I saw him dribble. Um, he ran four pick and rolls as the ball handler in 72 games, uh, for Madrid, uh, according to Instat, which is, um, a number, um, <laughs> And, like, the only time he's really allowed to dribble is is these open court situations, which, like, it makes sense. Like, the dribbling is extremely rudimentary. Mm. Um, But it's also, like, you can't get to being a good dribbler or a mediocre dribbler without being a bad dribbler in games. And so you sort of get this circumstance where it's, like, is he he being used in a way that, like, helps his NBA circumstance? The answer is kind of no, at least offensively. Um, And so you have to to ask questions of, like, what – like, would a team allow him to make these mistakes, knowing that, like, he basically had a year where he was encouraged to not dribble? Uh, here we get a yeah. good show. Here we get a good show, and it's going to lead to a steal. Like, how how do you park? Like, do you think that NBA teams will allow those mistakes? Do you think that there's still coaches that are going to be okay if he dribbles the ball off his foot, like every three games? Uh, it's. I mean, it's a cliche answer, but it's going to depend on the team. But like, they have to figure out if he can dribble, like it's rudimentary but like you have to know what he can do because right now if he can't dribble at all like he kind of has to be parked in the corner to where again you get a split the different situation then he can screen or cut because right now if he can't dribble then you can't run any like delay with him because who's gonna guard him Uh and he's not this super vertical spacer to where you can run some quick hitting dribble handoffs or something like that to where you can slip and get him rolling downhill because you're not he's not threatening the offense like that so he has to have some sort of development to where that opens up more usage for him yeah so you either turn him into like samuel down bear with a jumper mm-hmm. or like you you literally have to have somebody to, to like force him to be like i'm cool with whatever happens um here we get a good example of like what how good drop works for him where he's stunting between two options equally and he's able to get a deflection again a good a good idea uh, or a good execution for him, like a concept that he doesn't always track both. Again, he's disrupting a Shane Larkin skip pass from the inside pocket. Like, Shane Larkin isn't throwing this lefty. He's throwing it from his right pocket. Like, he, there's no way he should be able to cover this much ground on this show. Because like, you have to show on Larkin. And he just overreaches and is able to, like, deflect this ball enough that, that there's a reasonable closeout. Um, it, it reminds me a lot of PJ. Because PJ is really good at getting the ball the second it appears. Mm-hmm. Like, a, a lot of, like, refs won't call... If refs don't know what the offense is doing, they won't call the foul. So, mm-hmm. like, if you get it at the very beginning, whether it's up or down, there's a lot less likelihood that a whistle goes. I think there was a whistle on this particular 
Rockets game, but it's just like the earlier you go, the earlier you recognize, the earlier you swipe, the less likelihood that, that right. there's going to be a ref involvement because they just don't see it as like a protected act. So the second that the ball is really advanced, and again, PJ is another guy with super long arms who's undersized and strong. But like the second that English pushes, puts that ball out, it gets ripped. Um, and if that's the, the circumstance where he wins, that's a pretty like tough circumstance. But it does show that like guys who are like weird like him do exist in the NBA. Um, here's another one of your of your beloved Chucks. Um, he has double responsibility for that, for the roller and also for um, for the slot. He's able to get it uh, get to both, and I think he has a pretty good closeout here. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, I remember why the, this clip's in there. So yeah, happy feet. Um, <laughs> He gets happy feet. Uh, he switches his responsibility. He's now giving up middle. Uh, children may want to look away uh, <laughs> because he like it's he creates about eight feet of space with like a basic step back, which leads to our big problem with Usman is if he is a switch, if he is a switch guy, who does he guard? Because deceleration athletes are very much in vogue right now. Like the way that the rules are set up, along with like how spacing is set up, if you can get guys to alter their balance. I mean, Harden, Luca, Dame, with the, with the ability to step back, Steph. Those guys will harm you, and if you do, th- if you switch your feet around and and allow them to to change your ability to move, um, you get things like that, uh, where you're gonna end up on on some Twitter feeds. Mm-hmm. Um, do you think that switch from what you've seen? Do you think like casual switchability is a good thing? Like, it is possible for? I definitely think it's possible for him. Just again, like even with the technique not being great, like he just reacts to things so quickly that I think that gives him a larger margin for error. Now, granted, when he goes to the NBA, like the athleticism is going to pick up, and as you mentioned, like those guys with those massive deceleration skills, like all the ball handlers are attacking that front foot. Yeah. Like if you if you give any sort of shade to a guy that can pull off the dribble, then that makes them put you in the blender. Yeah. So, so here's an example of like a shooter that has fantastic uh, energy transfer in Tyler Hero, where it's just like the ball, it just flows from the toes up. And then when you watch like Garuba, sometimes it flows really nicely, sometimes it doesn't, which to me is the sign that like things are being worked. Um, here we have another like not understanding the angle of the pass. Like this is going to be a lob. It was always going to be a lob. This help is not going to get there in time. So you, like the first concern is the is the high lob. And if you if you can force them to overthrow it, so it's just like you know, prime DeAndre Jordan gets this and nobody else, then you've right. succeeded as a as a drop defender. Um, sometimes I feel like he hasn't put enough pressure on ball handlers um, to just like try crazy stuff, which is like a thing that happens with young with young guys is that like they just don't force people to be good. They like give them easy ways out by you know sort of contesting. Um, but that also speaks to the fact that, like he's not perfectly sized. If he's a center, if he he needs to be six ten to sort of, like, have his particular skill set and be awesome. Um, here's the jumper. Uh, I think uh, pick and pop's, like, 5% of his usage. Um, again, Gruba just doesn't, doesn't shoot that much. We see a good hop. We see an okay energy transfer. The The release changes its, its trajectory. Sometimes it's short, or sometimes it's flat. Sometimes it's really tall. Um, and now we're just in the shooting section. So um, you can see he's hopping every time. There's this wild, there's this hesitation. He'll come back and shoot it the second time, but like his impulse is towards winning plays, um, what I call academy brain, which is like where you're wired to, to do the right thing. And like famously, like Marcus Smart, who wired this way for a long time, where he just like didn't want to shoot. And the Boston organization said like, you will shoot until, like until you're a good shooter. And like that requires a, an investment in him. And like he still has times where he like will take extra time or will think about it. But like he's gotten shots up and he's become a guy you just don't want to leave open. Like, it's not ideal. There's certainly worse shooters on, on Boston. And I think that, like, that level of organizational investment will be necessary in Usman, where mm. if teams are like, eh, he'll figure it out, like, he might not. Um, and granted, he could, like, put some of the stuff together. Here we see, like, a bad miss, which you can see the hand comes out. Um, but, like, I think that more than anything, we're entering a time where um, teams are putting more, like, energy into their draft picks and being like, oh yeah, we'll run weird stuff for him or we'll, you know, make interesting developmental pathways. I mean, Poku turned into an awesome NBA player in four months. Mm-hmm. Uh, or it's like, yeah, for three months he was one of the worst players like you could really ever see. And then like he started to click together after the G League stint. Um, again, better energy transfer. So I think that that finding um, that finding those pathways will work. Um, so 
I just we have a, a, a little bit of time here, so I just wanted to, to ask you like what you thought about him in the modern NBA because you are uh, the modern NBA guy. Um, I'm just I'm just a humble draft book guy, so I only get to watch games when it fits my schedule. Like, where would you feel more comfortable, like playing him in terms of right now? Because I think he does have utility right now. Like because like Real Madrid would be a good team, mm-hmm. like in the NBA, uh, especially if they had an NBA salary cap. But like they would certainly not be like worse than the Thunder. Um, like, do you find him to be a five? 50% of the time defensively. Like, I think the defense is, is more complicated. Like how, how do you parse that in, in your viewings? Uh, like, I think like I'm more worried about the offense than the defense, honestly. Like I do think <clears throat> just how raw he is offensively combined with like how hesitant he is as a shooter. And just, of course, I only have a small sample to work with, with what I've watched from him. But, and I don't know how much of it is the way he thinks and how much of it is how Real Madrid kind of drills it. But, like, I just don't see a lot of off-ball screening for him. Like, if he's involved as a screener, it's because it's a pick-and-roll coming and they're setting up something. It's not a lot of impromptu stuff, so I don't know what his field is on that end. Mm-hmm. Um, so, the first thing that comes off the top of my head is Denver, mm-hmm. just because I think that unlocks him as a cutter. And, like, even if he doesn't get it, like, a guy like Nikola Jokic would just kind of force him into good positions just because he's a freaking wizard with the ball. Mm-hmm. And even in Denver, with the way that they play defense, playing Jokic up to the level of screen or a little bit higher, it kind of forces him into the rotations that he's already good at. Yeah. So <clears throat> I would still kind of worry about Don sizing him at the five, but maybe you wouldn't have to short term if you have like Jermichael Green still there or you have Paul Millsap there to where maybe they can soak up those five responsibilities defensively Mm -hmm. and both of those guys spread the floor enough to where you could still unlock them as a cutter and kind of drill some things there um so maybe like that's the type of spot for him but again he has to have some sort of offensive skill yeah um the next thing that that jumps out to me is the like wanting to win like the the academy brand where he like Mm -hmm. he clearly is wired to play a certain way um and he is, you know, uh, I think he's like 82 and 25 in his like two, two and a half years there, which is, again, like awesome. And he's doing it for a side that like would, I would say, be a friend playoff team, um, you know, with, with a salary cap. Do you feel comfortable with guys who have played smaller roles who may need to make mistakes? Um, and like, how how does that work? How does that adjustment to NBA culture, where like you play a lot of games and like you're about to lose a lot of games? I know that's a thing that like the good college guys struggle with. Like, do you do you see that as as a thing that like will be okay? Um, I could definitely see it being an issue because not only would he be moving from a winning situation, like he also needs he need he also needs to be set up. Yeah, is the issue. So like. A, you know, a college guard or an overseas guard that had a lot of success. Um, let's go Teo Melodon. Like, we've talked about him on the timeline. You've written about him. I've written about him, talked about the pod or whatever. Like, the losing obviously sucks for him, and he has some things to work through in terms of that academy brain, but he's also going to have the ball in his hands quite a bit so he can work through that. But Usman, like, he's not going to have that utility to begin with. Yeah. So you combine the you know, going from a winning situation to potentially a losing one. And also he's starting from such a deficit in terms of ball skills. You're going to need a very particular coach and a very particular developmental staff to where they trust him enough to make those mistakes. And I'm not sure how many of those teams are out there. Like, I think he kind of has to be drafted to a good team. Yeah. I think that might partially be why he's dropped on draft boards. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is that like, there, it's a it's a weird uh, Venn diagram of teams that have the infrastructure to invest, uh, like in terms of the availability, but also teams that have the infrastructure to make it work. Like a lot of teams could pour, you know, at, like you know, the ability to 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 shoot, which like I think I'll shoot long term. But like it's also that like, do you have the five that makes this make sense? Like a, a five that can invert 
the offense when they please and, and like can try all the weird like jazz type things where it's like, yeah, this possession or this possession we're blitzing. It's like awesome. The next one you're dropping and, and doing all these like strange things. The bad teams aren't good at that. Bad teams want to do the same thing every time down and like teach guys how to do the basics. And like I'm when you're under tooled and sort of like a weird positional player, the basics don't necessarily work. Very true. Like Another team just came to mind. Like, what would he look like in Minnesota now when you have a guy like Cat that can kind of invert the offense because of the way he shoots and the way he passes? And now they have a guy in Chris Finch that gets creative on both ends. Because I think the thing with Minnesota, at least over the past couple of years, is that you you look at their shot profile and it's a lot of shots at the rim, a lot of shots at threes, but the offense was so freaking bland that it kind of didn't matter. Um, So that... I don't know how great of a developmental context that was. And it kind of speaks to your point about bad teams that just kind of want to drill principles as opposed to trying new things and really exploring with their young guys outside of like their main prospect. Mm -hmm. And I don't envision him being a main prospect anywhere because of how far behind he is offensively with the ball in his hand. Yeah. I mean, I just don't think that he's uh, like, I don't think any team will view him as like the gem of their rebuild. Mm-hmm. Unless, like, there is just so much passing that's, like, hidden by his context. Like, I think he's a good passer, but I think that the passing also goes into the, like, winning mentality thing where, like, if he has wide open, like, if he has quick reads, he'll make them, like, almost every time. He's really good mm-hmm. at picking up skip passes. He, you know, he reads the dump offs. He sees the high lows. But, like, if he has to, like, take a dribble and, like, make the rotation happen and then parse the rotation, like, his he struggles with that because he's never been asked to do those things. So that can be difficult to teach a guy like I like who has passing skills but doesn't have the skills that connect to passing. Like he doesn't necessarily create the rotation. He doesn't necessarily create closeouts. Um, so like teams aren't are going to sag off of him, and if they're sagging, that's a much harder passing read to make. And if he's not able to to get like to do like R.J. Hampton things, where it's like if you close out badly, um, like even though R.J. isn't a great shooter, like if you if you're not angled right, he can still get to the cup because. Like he, he has the slinkiness and these other aspects. Right. Um, that's a that's a tough situation. Um, so, uh, Sawyer said Usman and Nazarid as the Timberwolves bench front court, which like you if you could just get them into do the like the do the sand dance, you have like an yeah. awesome you you would have the funnest. Uh, that would immediately be the funnest front court in the entire world. Um, the next thing is safe havoc. Um, you're a big defense guy. How how difficult is it to to cur- like, there's a, there's the Thompson quote about you want you know you'd rather have a, a, a fiery guy than, than a guy you have to wake up from the dead. Mm-hmm. Um, how is that for defenders who uh, are theoretically good but maybe are a little too wild uh, with their gambles and like is do you think that NBA teams corral that instinct? Do you think that instinct is is it, would you rather have a guy who doesn't try for those than a guy who can? Um, I. I think it kind of depends on the position, Mm -hmm. honestly. Like, you want it to be stout, but also, like, you can't really afford for your fives to make really crazy gambles. But I think at the four, you can kind of afford that kind of um, attention. Like, I look at what Nervous Noel is doing in New York right now. And Tibbs, it's funny, because, like, Tibbs has legitimately reined him in some with the coaching. And he still leads the NBA in goal teams. And so, like, that's just kind of the level of, and that's who Nerlens Noel has been his entire career. Yeah. As a guy that can make these ridiculous plays off the ball, um, can just swat shots from a standstill, can jump out on perimeter, has these crazy tools, can jump passing lanes and all that good stuff. But, like, reeling him in is just incredibly tough. So I think if you get him with a good coach or at least put him in a good enough infrastructure, you can, A, teach him some of the gambles that don't really work on the NBA level mm-hmm. and kind of rein him in some. But even if that's still the way he's wired, if you put him around good enough defenders or in a good enough scheme or good enough coaching, he won't be in position to make those bad gambles, if that makes sense. Yeah. And you can kind of rein him in naturally that way. And then you just still have the insane instincts that you just flat out can't teach. Yeah, I, I think that thinking like I think that when people compare him to Draymond or or, or, or Millsap or I guess like to some degree uh, James Johnson it's still like these are players who are added value to teams with vision but aren't necessarily particularly great for teams that don't right. um, and that like 
players like on a bad team, players who have who struggle with closeout mechanics or like are partially switchable. I think like partially switchable is a thing that like bad teams really struggle with. Is because they just want to like they you get you know they want bad teams want to deal in absolutes. Um, so it's like you know you don't switch them on the hardens of the world, but you're okay against like a Chris Paul. And it's like that's a hard thing to on a bad team to parse. It's like well this guy has this particular movement style, or he he takes he has a shot profile that we're okay with this switch. That's difficult to find additional value for for a head coach and and for a team. Um, and and that kind of brings us to to lineup theory, where it's like you have a guy who has these really unique skills, like who you know may or may not be a shooter long term. Um, who I think they're like they're it there's a real upside for a team that can figure things out. Like if you had to uh, find the best circumstance for him, it doesn't have to be a team, but just like if you were building a collection of skills at the three and the five, you know, at the, as the two front court players surrounding him, like what, what do you see as the ideal pairings for him? Um, if you're just looking at it from the three, I think from the team perspective, again, I think it's Denver, but if you're just looking at it positionally, like a five that can space, I think would make some sense for him. <clears throat> and then the three, and really just any of the perimeter players, you need guys that can just get it off the bounce and can kind of get generate downhill pressure mm-hmm. to simplify things for him off the ball. Because if you have guys around him that can scramble the defense and you have you know, the other guys kind of space the floor, then you can put him in those um, advantage situations. Like maybe it's not the dunker spot. Again, I have questions about the vertical pop there. But even if it's not that and you're stashing him in the corner or something, those are easier reads. He can screen, he can cut. If he does make the catch, one dribble on a drive and the defense is already scrambling, you mentioned he can already, he can pick out the easy reads. So he needs to be in a situation to where there can be advantages created for him, and then he can just kind of connect from there. Yeah, I, I mean, if I had to try to... Like, the first thing that I would honestly look at when thinking about, like, does Usman Group make sense for a team is I look at the head coach, and it's like... How willing to get weird are you? Because, like, not every coach is willing to be like, okay, so we're going to have, you know, this guy who can't, you know, dribble, like, at least right now, initiate some offense or, like, try things out. Um, I think that if we're just thinking in terms of archetypes, like, I would want a three who's just a usage sink and then a five who could shoot. So, like, Mm -hmm. to me, that if you were, you know, trying to think of, like, ideal fits, like something like Dallas makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Where it's, like, and, like, again, you have questions about, like, how do how does group fall or, or, you know, what, what moves are made or what's that team look like in a year. But it's, it's the idea of like, you can run that offense so many different ways and mm-hmm. you can find like a lot of the matchups that group will struggle with. You can put Luca on theoretically. Like Luca has to, you know, give effort every single night on the defensive end, but he's not going to struggle with deceleration athletes in the way that group would. And you can also throw him at some of the bigger guys in a way that would like Chris Tapps would, would have some, some issues. Right. Um, so I like, to me, I think that there are a lot of um, there are a lot of unique circumstances. I mean, like Golden State is the one that I also came back to because, like, in a world where like they don't have Wiseman, like I would be pitching this as like, look, it, this is where it makes a lot of sense. You don't have, you don't need him to do anything. Like with the ball, you have a whole bunch of wings who will attack downhill, so like they'll they'll create pressure, and you get to, like they'll take open threes. Like of course, mm-hmm. with Wiseman, it becomes a different thing because you can't have both of them in the dunker spot. Um, regardless of, of how good of, of spacing you have with the rest of the three players. Um, I want to thank you for coming on. I know this is, uh, this is a little bit uh, different and a little bit outside your wheelhouse, but I, I really appreciate the insight that you brought. Uh, you got uh, time for like 20 minutes or so of Q&A? Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Let me flip over to the Q&A screen. And, uh, yeah, uh, questions about, about Usman, questions about the NBA at large, questions about dealing with fame. Uh, something I have no experience <laughs> with, but um, but I know. I don't know, man. You want a dunk contest? That's kind of, that's pretty cool. Uh, are we coming through uh, with both of us on this on this new uh, page? Just double checking. Are we getting Nikias on this one? Uh, every time I switch a, a scene, I have to ask now because. Uh, <laughs> It, you're showing up on my monitor, but yeah, okay, we're good. Um, okay, uh, yeah, Mobley or Usman on, on the Warriors would be unfair. Um, yeah, that that's a Mobley is specifically a, a, an issue, uh, just because like I don't know, like that's that's so much switching. Um, 
Um, how would you beat a switch? And this is this is a good. One. How would you beat a switch on a team where you do have Usman as, as uh, uh, and you're running pick and roll? Ooh, wait. So with him on offense or defense? With him on offense. With him on. Oh man, <clears throat> like. I saw some flashes of him like slipping and sealing. Like he seems to have like the angles correct there. But again, I just don't know what the finishing looks like at the rim. Um, maybe it's a screen and seal to kind of force the switch and then you go to the corner. And then whoever's attacking that switch can kind of create an advantage from there. And again, that puts him in that position to screen cut or whatever from there. I think that you would just have to go basically to go screens. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, slipping them into another action. So, like, in, imagining the Warriors fit, like, you'd run some sort of, like, slot pick and roll where he's coming from the middle. You'd have him mm-hmm. slip it, and then you'd have a guard lifting from, like, under the rim towards that corner. Yeah. Um, to essentially just use the, the like, in the event where the people are switching off ball, you might get a switch onto, like, on a guard, and he can seal that and just, like, either try to bang it or, um, or get fouled. Like, I think that you can beat switches with him. It's just that, like, you basically have to have a playbook four times where he's the screener and Mm -hmm. build a four man around him that can leverage those things. I mean, Golden State makes the most sense just because they can, they have a playbook that's been designed for that for years because they've been Mm -hmm. trying to solve this problem. Albeit the the Bentley version of this problem, but this problem. (laughs) Um, So I, I think that that's the best way to do it. I mean, you could probably run a bunch of Spain or invert it or like, you know, run pick and roll that it, it becomes a second screen. But that would be my general answer: is just overload gravity on the weak side and and try to get uh, and try to get as much uh, like free shots for teams that think they can switch those things and ask them guards to to show then recover then then switch and right. they can get duck-ins. Um So Usman is a wing offensively for me, yes, um, because I would not want to play him at the bottom. Um, I wouldn't want to play him at the five unless I have like Cat or Porzingis or uh, uh, three point shooting Mitchell Robinson, you know, guys who um, can invert offense, but even still, like you, you still want like them to functionally be a five. So I, I think that viewing him as a wing makes the most sense from team building. Um, it makes it the most sense. To, like, I think it's more likely that he becomes a shooter and is able to attack closeouts than he gains a lot more vertical pop. Like, he's not going to get two or three inches taller, at least I don't think so. Um, considering that he's been like a grown man since he was 15. Um, I don't know if you saw it. Like he, he won MVP at Spain's or at the FIBA U16 championships when he was 14. Uh, which is like, again, and he roughly had this body at 14, just one of those people who just like was grown really, really young. Um, so like to the idea that he's going to get dramatically taller and become this like vertical threat five doesn't make sense to me, but it seems more likely that the NBA, which like has taken a guy like Damari Carroll who like, shot 17 threes in his senior season and has turned him into a shooter and somebody that can attack closeouts. To me, that makes more sense. I don't know about Nikai, if you're, if you're of the same mind on that one. Um, like I, I just kind of squarely view him as a four, honestly. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't go three just because I, I just don't know if he can dribble. Yeah. And I think that <clears throat> that just limits things tremendously in terms of his usage. So I, I think four put him around the front, you know, front court spacer and then, a wing, like you said, that can handle those um, responsibilities. Uh, another team I thought about was Indiana. Yeah. They have they have Miles Turner. They have a lot of guards that can dribble and get to the rim. Not sure what happens once they get there, but can at least create those advantages. Like maybe that's another landing spot for them. And it's a solid enough team. And then you have a guy like Nate Yorker who isn't afraid to experiment on either end of the floor. So maybe that's kind of the developmental context for them. I had the cheating answer, um, which is uh, Toronto. <laughs> But yeah. and hear me on this: in the world where they they will are willing and happy with playing OG at the five, like so you basically get the idea of inverting the offense. But he like you can use him as sort of an offensive hub because that's not necessarily where OG is super comfortable. Like mm-hmm. you're running like you know like DHO gets, but with Usman as, as the as the trigger man and letting OG space and attack closets. I think that could work. But again, I'm also just like the cachet of the Raptors development sort of is covering more for that idea than like the intellectual backing is uh have you seen scotty barnes yet 
Uh, I have not seen okay. Scotty Barnes. Okay, so I can answer this one. Who projects better as a small ball five between Scotty and Usman? Uh, Scotty does because Scotty has to be a five. Scotty can't be a wing, and I think Usman will be because Scotty doesn't have the the movement skills to, to do these things. And like Usman has some troubles, um, mostly because like things are difficult. Uh, the, the skills that he's being asked to, to do are very hard, especially to do that while also being a big and like um, movement skills and practice skills don't like you you they don't necessarily overlap. Like if you work on you know, big skills for 20 minutes, you're not necessarily working on the same movements that are going to pay off as a win. Um, to me, Scotty's a pure five, and that's how I've been treating him. Um, what's the precedence likelihood of a prospect improving as a vertical athlete? Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of people who have improved as a vertical athlete, but the thing you sort of need is that, like, the people who have developed them previously have to be really, uh, like, not good. Like, um, like uh, I'll use the most extreme example because it's, it's very illustrative, even if I don't find it particularly useful. Like, Giannis did not have uh, a supportive, like, childhood. Like, he didn't eat full meals. Uh, he was, like, didn't have, like, he didn't get as much sleep as he had to work. And so once he got into a, an environment that had both, like, food and a weight room, he put on a huge amount of weight. It's not that Giannis, like Giannis would probably have like been a more muscular dude if he had always been eating and he'd been exposed to like a normal weight room, but because he was supposed to no weight room and not enough nutrition, that's where it's like, that is where a lot of the growth came from. Uh-huh. There are a lot of people who have put on like good physical gains, especially like pop gains. Um, usually they're two foot guys because they have like posterior chain issues. A lot of the guys who don't put on weight are like guys like Zach Levine or just, like, have hollow bones and have been able to jump like that forever. Um, but I would say that um, that there is precedence, um, it's, but it usually requires a circumstance that's pretty different than his mind, who's been, like, a, a basically a child property since he was 13 or 14. Um, okay, here's, here's one. Uh, you've watched Atlanta this year, right? Obviously. Yes. Okay. How? Let me. Hear, how did? How is this phrased? What are the differences between uh, Usman and Onyeka for you in your experiences with both? Um, <clears throat> I think you're just starting with the physical profile. Like, just the length is what kind of separates the two. Um, the usage. I actually want Atlanta to use him on ball a little bit more. Like, mm-hmm. I think he has more to explore. As like a dribble handoff hub, like I think he's a fine passer. Um, mm-hmm. I would like to see a little bit more of that. Um, maybe that comes with him playing with, maybe that comes with him playing with Trey more. If they ever, <clears throat> if they ever lean into that more, giving Clint Capella some wrist or whatever, and you kind of leverage Trey's gravity there and get him rolling on short roll situations and stuff like that. Um, I think just more lifting and just more ball skills in general. Yeah. That's what I mean- stuff too. I mean, it, it's funny because they're both, they both they both sort of have the same profile. Like both were child stars. Like Onyeko was a freshman on one of the, I would say one of the three best high school teams of all time. Um, but he was also like the 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 his his freshman year of high school. He was very much a, a role player within a great team. But by his senior year, like if high school, he, the the offense was built around him, and then USC things were built around him, and he was able to explore his ball skills in a way that like Usman never has been. Even when he plays for Spain, it's not necessarily the same thing. Like. When he plays U16 or U18, it's like he's just so much bigger than people, so it doesn't quite like youth basketball is, is much more uh, susceptible to like warping by physical tools in a way that like the pros aren't just because like if you're you have guys who are just like can be stronger than you and like you know look like Shaq, um, and, and that's just you know about time and place and the level of competition. Um, for me, the difference between Anyeka is like Anyeka has so much better feet. Um, Anyeka was showing to half court in college games. Um, and like his is short area quickness, um, and Usman is, is like he can uh, in the piece that that's coming out tomorrow. I compare him to like uh, using Bowser and Mario Kart, where like he can get up to big speeds, but he's not necessarily the fastest when it comes to change of direction and, and, and out of the blocks. Um, where Anyeka is sort of like is very much like a, a light character in Mario Kart, where he's out of the block super quickly. He doesn't have the highest speed, but he can get there fast and, and move at an almost guard like. Um, I think both of them would are better in systems where they have the ball done. 
um, who's not the essential for his development in Nyeka because there's a lot of untapped uh, playmaking potential um, and how Atlanta handles that going forward is like one of the more interesting things. Um, but like they've, they've been on a run and he's, he's starting to get a little more burned, obviously like an injury setback. Uh, which college program would have put Usman in the best situation to succeed this year? Hmm, that is a difficult one. Um, college pl programs are not generally known for um, player empowerment. It's sort of the other way around. Um, I mean, Loyola did a great job uh, with Santi of just like giving him possessions to figure out what he wanted to do. Um, I would have really liked to see like, obviously, like, Mobley is there, but, like, him at USC, where they, like, do have a lot of uh, high pick-and-roll possessions. I mean, like, the question of, like, what offense would I like Usman to be in a in development environment is fascinating. Um, I think that, like, I would like to see him in a context very similar to, like, what, uh, what Pascal had in New Mexico State, um, where, like, he was so, like, there was so much unformed about him that they basically just, like, threw him usage and were like, yeah, figure it out. Like, we'll see what sticks, we'll see what doesn't. And I think that was really beneficial for him in a way that, like, not, I don't think everybody should necessarily get usage sync seasons, but guys who have never had that kind of usage, I think that, like, a G League environment where, or, um, you know, a lower competition environment, like, in soccer, there's a loan system, um, where it's just like, yeah, you go figure it out and see, like, what you can do at this level. Um... I think that that makes the most sense to me. Like, what, if you were to, if you were to give him a loan, you know, in in the in the soccer sense, like, what what do you think? Like, what would you be looking for in a situation for for a guy who's wired like this? Let's say for whatever reason he's in the twenty twenty two draft. What would you be telling you know a, a prospect? I think in, I think for him it would have to be one of two extremes. Like, I would re I would want him in. You know, that kind of developmental context that you mentioned with Pascal, where it's like, hey, here's the ball, figure it out. Or I would just want him in the most pro style ready available just to so get used to making the reads. So, like, I was going to ask you about, like, what would he look like at Gonzaga with a, with a floor that's super spread and you already, I mean, they're going to recruit well and get some high caliber ball handlers. So he'll be used to kind of making those secondary reads, if that makes sense. I mean, you, you did accidentally just land on uh, one of the long term fits I would like to see most which is Chet Holmgren and Usman Garuba. Um, because that's going to be, that, that covers all of the uh, flaws with like none of the problems. Um, and that would be one that if I, if you know, we were talking about you know, thinking ahead and looking at future draft stocks, it'd be like, well, there's a whole bunch of interesting, you know, six ten guys that I could potentially play at center. Like, yeah, I would probably grab Garuba a little higher. Um, See, get one or two more, and, and we can get out of here. Um, All right. Yes, Usman and Chat would be a, a, a draft Twitter. We can we can spend this. It just have to be about Usman. I mean, we have uh, Mr. MBA here. Um, any any questions for him? Uh, he's more than competent. <laughs> well, while we wait, no NBA questions. Uh, how would you feel about Usman in Memphis? Um, okay, so he has a good, like, I guess the idea is to cover up the, the Jaron rebounding problem. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, I feel like Memphis is now, like, where all of my favorite weirdos go. Um, and, like, I, I guess he'd also be sort of hunting on Brandon Clark as a concept. Mm -hmm. Much like, you know, the early returns are very mixed um, for the first two years. I think I'm fine with it. I feel like at that point you have to go pretty far down the... I think that he's not going to go to Memphis. I don't really love it because, like, I kind of want Jaron to be heavier usage, and I'm not sure if that enables him to, like, have a higher usage. Like, also, we haven't seen him this year, which makes it really difficult. But mm -hmm. that is, uh, I think that that would be one of my secondary fits. I think I like the Suns better. Um, Ooh, that would be fun. Yeah. Thank you, Sona. Uh, Mostly because, like, I think it would force him to shoot in a really interesting way. Also, him and Chris Paul on defense would just be so much fun. Because mm -hmm. Chris Paul would turn him into um, 
an MF very, very quickly. Um, and that would be great. Also, like, I feel like if I could pick a guy to, like, give players with academy brain to, Chris Paul, because he's just going to be like, that's a, you know, a 1.2 point per position shot, and you take that shot, I don't care. Like, I will never yell at you if you take this shot. I do not care. Yeah. Um, uh, here we go. Here is a, a question that I'm very excited to hear you answer. Um, is Tyler Hero playing up to his playoff level? Well, <laughs> no. No, he's not. Uh, and this is not- Okay, and here's the, here's the follow-up I'm going to include, is that, mm. is that about who the, the player Tyler Hero is? Or is that about the player that Tyler Hero was in the bubble? Like, <clears throat> I just find it hard to have a real gauge on him this season because everything has just been kind of a mess. Like, I like Miami's idea to kind of give him those point guard reps. Like, I don't think he's a – I don't think he's a point guard in the league, but I think giving him that on-ball responsibility is important to seeing, like, what he can do and trying to get a better handle of what his actual ceiling is going to be if you're building it out with him alongside Bam and Jimmy. But even around that, like, he's been hurt. Jimmy's been out. Bam missed some time. Like, any guard that the Heat had in the room that could get to the rim and make things easier on him, either completely aged out like Goran or has been hurt or you, or you get Victor Oladipo in there and then he gets hurt too. So the role has changed. The context around him has changed. He didn't have an off season. And he also just has his limitations. Like even with him getting more on ball reps, like the handle isn't especially tight. The burst isn't great. Um, something that I pointed out on my account a while ago is that <clears throat> if you ice him at all and pick and roll, like you know he's going to do is a hezzy into a crossover and teams are like sitting on it and picking him clean when he goes to it. So like he needs to develop counters on his own. Um, like I still think he's going to be good. Uh, so I'm not going to go as far as saying like the bubble is a fluke or anything, but I think we are a year away from seeing like who he really is, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so um, not to reach for old faithful but there is um, there is a tripartite system where people get hype then the league kind of figures out what they like mm-hmm. and that can take two months that can take a year that can take two years and then the player kind of figures it out like mm-hmm. they figure out oh these are the coverages that people are doing now like it may not be about who i am as a player it's about how they want to push me. and learning the counters for those counters and like we are firmly in the second cycle it doesn't matter really how good he was in the playoffs. It's that it's that teams have a playbook that they are going to execute until he changes who he is as a player or Miami makes an adjustment. And right. when you do that wall, you add more. Like, if you do that in the same role, people can generally have, like, better second second years. But the reason why slop, sophomore slump exists as a term is because that's happening while you're, average, while you're adding usage. While, like, you're getting – you have new things to learn – and the old things are now being countered. And, like, I agree that, like, a lot is happening. And I think that, um, I think that uh, there are real concerns about him. But I also think that, like, you do need multiple years of, like, figuring out, like, okay, when did, when did the book come out on Tyler Hero? Okay, how is that he looked since that book? And what has he added? What has he changed to counter those counters? And I think that since we're still in section two, like there's not, you can't really come to a definitive conclusion unless you really want clicks, or you mm. really want to like have a, a firm opinion um, that like is like based on how the NBA has worked. But like, I think that what you can judge is that like what he is not is uh, like this this true primary. Like I think that we can come to ter- like what he is not currently is a true primary, mm. and like Miami is trying to add secondary ability, you know, adding the ability to make these reads, but. And, like, there's nothing wrong with that as, the, like, separating the player from, separating the player from, like, the, our labels of a player is really important. And that's, uh, that's the difficulty that, like, I think that the Heat fans and, and national media, I guess if that's a term, even though I am sitting here with national media, um, <laughs> Mr. National Media. Um, High praise. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You don't deserve it at all. I don't know what I'm talking about. 
Um, True. Um, is that like, it, I think that like, it's not that we, I, I don't think people like get crowned too early. It's the like, like we're saying with John Morant, so I'm just like, the league has more counters than we all give them credit for. And that they spend mm -hmm. a, a year tinkering and it's really hard to have two back-to-back -back seasons where you show people new things. It's like, second albums are hard because you spend the first album writing your whole life down then you got like six months of new experiences. It's like, eh, it, you just have less time to, to learn new things. Mm -hmm. Um... On a scale of one to ten, how enthused would you be if his mom was drafted by the Miami Heat? Uh. Hmm. Like probably a six, maybe. I feel like I'd be annoyed by the pick, not necessarily because of him, because even with the limitations, I like him as a prospect. You give me anyone that can defend like he can, like I'm just happy with it. But I'll be more upset about <clears throat> I'd be more upset about last year's draft if they did pick him or if they got a pick to pick him for that matter. Because yeah. you get him like what do you have precious for? And why did you pick precious when you had like Maxi on the board and Desmond Bain on the board? Um, so then to pop that up with basically the precious replacement would be a bit bittersweet, even if I do like Usman on his own. Yeah, I mean, I think that picking Usman after Precious, like, I, in, like cards on the table, I think Usman is a, a much, much better prospect than, than Precious. It's basically saying that, like, you can't ever play those two on the court at the same time. Like, it's impossible. And so then, like, what, someone of them done the third unit? Like, how does that work in terms of developmental allocation? Um, are you sending one to Sioux Falls? Like, how how is this going to work? And, like, there's basically no way to get Usman to... Um, to Miami without it being a, a partial, if not full, indictment of the draft process last year, and right. how they how they perceived how close they were to a title, which is how I've always sort of translated the Precious pick as like an older, more fluid guy. Even if like Precious is, is still raw, like he is in age, like a little like more mature, um, it's like oh yeah, we're just we just need a little bit more energy, like you know a little more joie de vivre. Uh, who knows what he can like? Who can move his feet in the playoff series? We're that close to a title, and like I personally don't have that conclusion. So I would have aimed for Desmond Bain because he's good at basketball mm -hmm. uh, in a really specific way that the league should value. Um, but that's you know a, a hobby course that I'll be on for the rest of my life. Um, <laughs> I, I think that that's um, I think that like that's what makes the draft really fascinating to me um, is that like you can have good picks that are bad decisions. And like, it's not about being right or wrong. It's about the re like, it's about the processes that led you to be right or wrong. Right. Like, I've talked a bunch about how I was right on on PJ Washington, but for the wrong reasons. And so it's like I wasn't actually right on PJ. Like, it, like I was right in that. Like, I was like, this guy is going to be good. But like, I thought that he was like a, I don't want to say on ball creator, but like, I thought that he was a version of what Bam is. In terms of his ability to like make reads and draw a bunch of fouls and have this elite body control. And like that's mm. just, that's not entirely true. Um, did, did PJ turn out to be better than like people were saying after freshman year? Yes. Um, is probably some of his elevation due to the fact that he's playing with an elite creator now and one other ball. Also, yes. Um, mm -hmm. But like I think that what makes Miami and like really successful franchises so fascinating is that like you get to really get insight into their processes with the picks that they have, and you get to sort of see how the later you go on the draft, the more it's about the team making the pick and how they view themselves, and it's about the prospect. Right. Because once you're past a certain point, there's not, like, real home run swings. You can get a tail on Horton Tucker, but, like, it's usually more rare where you get, like, a guy that's like, he's not going to really be a roster spot for us. We're just taking a swing. Like, that's pretty rare. You mostly have to make picks that you're like, can this person get us two more points per is that, like two more points for this five man lineup in the third quarter of a game three in mm -hmm. the first round. Like, and, and when you look at those decisions that way, it becomes really fascinating to me. Um, all right, let's see if we can get one last question um, and, and we'll get out of here. And I just want to thank Nikai so much for his time. Uh, let me scroll back. If anybody has anything uh, that they'd like to fire off, I'd really appreciate that. And with a, a little philosophy or a league wide stuff. Okay. I do also really dig Jaron Usman. I just it's a that's a tough that's a tough one for for Jaron's usage that seeing more of him this year. That would be in my TV pile.
let's see. I'm sorry, Dallas is doing what to Golden State? Good Lord. Uh, it, it appears to be not good. 62 to 29. <clears throat> uh, it... That's so hard to do. I need to pull up like basketball reference tomorrow morning and see what Steph's, um, see what his stats are since that <clears throat> I should be MVP quote came out. But I imagine we get some high comedy out of that. Uh, I'm not going to get phone calls about it from my father. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> uh, literally every national media call about the Warriors. I get a lot of phone calls. Um, scrolling back to this top, try to find something and pull over the punch. Okay, C B Boston. Good for them. Or bad for them actually, because yeah. they're uh needing to lose those games. Oh, no Tatum when they started semi older, but that makes sense. Okay. Okay, C A D E. Um <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna kinda combine questions together to, to form a, a, a general question. For you, which is that switch big is a term, um, and it's it's uh, it's like the closest thing that we currently have to two way wing, which is a phrase from 1997 that just meant um, people who are really good. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that switch bigs with the, the degree of difficulty that that NBA teams put on bigs with how many actions they can run? Um, shout out to the guard bumper, which is an extremely hard action to, to defend. Like. Will we see more, like, actual stretch switch bigs who can switch, I would say, like, 50% or more of pick and rolls against, like, most creators? Um, or are, are switch bigs going to become more rare because teams are just going to spam um, bad, like, guys who can kind of switch? They're just going to find them and target them. Do you think that switch bigs, which, like, Usman is a bet to be a switch big for me, are those going to be more or less common in the next 10 years of NBA? Uh, I feel like we're going to see more just by virtue of, like, without a rule change, I just don't see how you can afford to play anything, like, in the playoffs at least. Like, I think you just kind of have to be switched heavy at a certain point. Mm -hmm. Because it's all going to be about... <clears throat> Again, like closing those windows, making sure you don't have, you don't allow those advantages for teams to create. Because if you're playing drop in the playoffs, like once you get to round two, you're just, I mean, ask Milwaukee what's happened to them as the lead of the, as their defense has been. If you're primarily playing drop and you have any sort of pull up threat or a movement shooter, then you can just kind of spam empty corner dribble handoffs or just high pick and rolls in general and get good looks out of it. So I think as we move, more into like more wings are developing as pull-up threats, deep pull-up threats. Like that's been a big thing with Jason Tatum over the last couple of years. Like he isn't just pulling up against drop, he's pulling up deep against drop now. Um, that's been a big portion of Zach Levine exploding as an offensive player. He's always been a good scorer, but now he's taking 28, 30 foot pull-up threes now. Like as more wings are shooting, like I think you're going to need bigs that can at minimum play to the level of the screen. And at that point, if you can play to the level of the screen comfortably and slide, you know, slide back a step or two and be fine, then trust them to sw to switch outright and do a couple slides. So I think teams are going to be hunting out those kind of things more moving forward. Yeah, um, I think that the value of them will go up, and as a result, some of the wings who like wanted to play four will now just want to play five. That you'll always need to have a certain amount of like guys who. Um, like are needed to defend and beat 
if you're just going to meet like at least one or two guys on the roster who can hold minutes in a playoff series. But basically, mm-hmm. all of the people we would currently think of as fours, like if, if the Morris Twins came into the league now, people would ask them to play five. Like mm-hmm. at least some of their minutes. So I think that it's not going to be like six, eight guys, like, oh, you play four and there'll be a five. It's like, well, maybe 20% of your minutes you're also playing five as you get into that second contract and, and really add strength. Um, right. So I think that like we're going to see less of like the slow footed big man in general, but we're going to mm-hmm. see more wings who pick up like second duty as like a small ball five on a second unit um, as like, as the more, as, as more um, like just extreme ball handlers that happen. <laughs> like we're going to get another wave of like ludicrous ball handlers in the next three or four years. And if you put Cantor or, like some of these like backup centers on an island, it's just not going to work. And like as we're just seeing, like there's less of those guys. Mm-hmm. As just like there's just like you have Sengun in this draft, but like basically those dudes don't really exist. And so who's going to take that roster spot? And I think it's going to be you know guys who are six eight, six nine, two thirty, two forty, who decide that they can play a little bit of five. Um, so uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody that that uh, stuck with us. Um, I want to say thank you to you. Um, let the people know. I mean, I, I do. This is like asking, you know, uh, you can't. You shouldn't ask celebrities to plug things like they all know where the movie is. But you want to just just plug your stuff. I mean, for for any person in, who could possibly be in this chat and not know who who he is. Oh man. Well, you can follow me on Twitter at Nikias NBA N E K I E S NBA. Uh, you find my written work at basketballnews.com. And you can listen to the podcast, The Dunker Spot, the host every week with Steve Jones Jr., former NBA assistant coach and video coordinator. Um, you can find that on Apple, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, Podbean, wherever you get your podcast, we should be there. Wow, what a pro. Just just hit all those beats so quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, um, so thank you guys. Uh, I really appreciate everybody who, who sticks around and, and – uh, and does this. Um, if you can subscribe to the Patreon, I, I always appreciate that. Um, I really want to make this a spot where uh, people can come and, and promote their work. And, uh, and uh, I mean, most importantly, it's like I, I want to pay my guests um, and make sure that they have, uh, like, writing is hard. It's a, it's a really difficult job. Coaching is a really difficult job uh, to, to, to eke out a living. Um, so I just want to say, uh, like if you if you can support the Patreon, that, that's what helps me fund this, along with the editing and, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for coming along. Thank you so much for uh, for sticking with us. Uh, there's always technical difficulties, and I, without you guys, I would literally have a silent, silent broadcast because I would not record any of this. Um, so yeah, thank you everybody for for being in chat, for <laughs> for bearing with us, and uh, yeah, I just want to say thank you to Kai. Thanks for having me, man. It's an honor. Have a a wonderful night.